So first of all, thanks for having me, and uh, special thanks to Michael for extending my session from half an hour to an hour. So I'm gonna torture you guys <laughs> for at least an hour. So we're gonna talk about the uh, multi-generation RU. And uh, um, my name is Yu Zhao. I'm from Google. I've been working on managing RU for about a couple of years. And uh, so let's start it. So I'm, I'm going to um, touch on some uh, uh, fundamental stuff. Probably, you know, it's not that interesting, but I think it's important. So the fundamental role of RAM, basically, uh, Turing machines do not need RAM. And uh, the uh, RAM, the role of RAM basically is to cache information for immediate use. And it's the same role as CPU cache, but at slower speed and cost. So um, an example would be uh, a smartphone without RAM, if it could work, would be uh, still faster than early mainframes. So I stole a picture from uh, uh, Wikipedia. So you can see here, is, is this is a, a, a Turing machine. It's a pure mechanical. So why we care about RAM efficiency, our observations are the speed gap between RAM and storage likely to remain large, and also the RAM price unlikely to drop drastically in the foreseeable future. Also, the uh, memory used from uh, complex workloads certainly going to keep growing. And the prediction is, our prediction, of course, um, RAM will continue to play a major role in performance. So here I have a distribution that uh, illustrates uh, our current memory utilization dilemma. Basically, um, for a given workload at a different time, it uses a different amount of memory. And uh, so the uh, uh, Y uh, axis is the possibility of the memory usage, where the uh, for example, today it uses 100 meg, and tomorrow probably going to use 200 megs. And uh, so the uh, X axis is the uh, utiliz utilization uh, configuration, or the usage. So for such a uh, workload, we definitely have to over-provision memory. Basically, we have to give uh, this workload, let's say on average it requires 200 meg. And we have to probably configure 300, even more memory. And the, the um, green part is the um, profit margin. And the yellow part is somehow, you know, we just hit a wall and uh, have a long latency. And then when we reach the uh, red part, we're going to have ohm kills and live locks. So that's why we care about RAM efficiency, because um, more efficient than higher profit margin. So two fundamental problems of RAM. So the first problem is, uh, or challenge, is what a object to cache. So uh, that's, uh, the, uh, function. that's why we need RIU, to decide uh, what object to cache. And the second fun fundamental problem is how to cache more objects. So basically, we have in external and internal uh, fragmentations. And uh, that's also why we use ZRAM or uh, compaction to reduce internal fragmentation and uh, external fragmentation. So here I have two diagrams. The, the, the one on the top is uh, illustrates how IRU works. Basically, we want to uh, keep red objects, uh, reddish objects, basically are hot ones. Uh, in RAM and code objects, uh, those you know are bluish colors in disk or you know slower storage. So the uh, picture on the bottom shows uh, fragmentations. So for a single page, if you look at this single page, we say okay, uh, user space request requests a 32 meg allocation, but on the hardware can't just give this user space. Uh, 32 meg, or uh, 32 bytes. So it has to give this uh, uh, user-space a, a program, 4K page. So that's that. So the rest unused uh, part basically is wasted. That's the internal fragmentation. So if you look at the entire RAM, 
So different allocations have different orders, and they have uh, different coldness, hotness, and that's 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 uh, uh, external fragmentation. That's all, uh, also why uh, when we try to allocate huge pages, sometimes you know uh, allocation fails. So uh, MGRU and its goals. So there are three uh, major goals: simplicity, flexibility, and performance. Uh, so okay, probably I should go, uh, take a step back. So what exactly is MGRU? Uh, in very simple words, probably crude, it's basically we partition memory into more buckets. With active and inactive RU, we only have two buckets. So the um, bluish colors mean code, code memory. And the uh, reddish color, uh, colors means card memory. So here uh, on the left, we have uh, um, you know, one red purple color, another, uh, the other uh, blue um, um, purple color. So that's, that's how generally uh, active active works. And then on the right side, we have uh, four, uh, five buckets. So we have uh, we partition the memory into uh, more segments. So each bucket contains um, different kind of uh, diff different uh, code hot um, pages. That, that's uh, basically how uh, MGRU works. And uh, okay, next questions so far. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna look at. Uh, MGRU internals. So there are three components, generations, page table walks, and feedback loops. So uh, this big picture shows how generally uh, MGRU works. So uh, there are two hands here. Basically, this is a clock, OK? There are two hands. So the first hand, which is the red one, I call, uh, we call it agent. So this hand basically goes into uh, the uh, MM list, a list here, to uh, find out, to gather all the access bits from ta page tables. So that's the uh, page table box, right? So the uh, other hand, the black one, I call it eviction. This one goes, uh, to the uh, goes uh, walks the uh, page list, physical pages, to uh, evict pages, and at the same time for each page, it also uh, walks R map to uh, check the access bit again. So basically, we have uh, we check the access bit at least twice. So um, where 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 are the generations? So we have uh, here we have uh, grouped physical pages into um, uh, dotted um, squares, these three. So these are actually uh, generations, right? So the first generation, which is the oldest one, um, born at T0. And the second one uh, is the previously youngest, but now it's like in the middle, and is um, born at T2. And then the youngest generation born at T3. So these are generations. And uh, we have, uh, uh, for each physical page, we have a generation uh, number counter in the uh, folio uh, flag, uh, page flags or folio flags. Now it's called folio flags. Sorry, I should use struct folio, not struct page here. And uh, so this number indicates which generation this page uh, belongs to. So on the uh, aging path, if a page has been accessed, we update this generation number to the youngest. Okay, basically we tag this page. Okay, this page is a hard page, so don't, don't, don't touch it uh, during evict, uh, don't evict it. Okay, on the eviction pass, so but, but, but the, um, during AJ, we don't really sort this page. We just only tag this page, right? Now, now this page is, uh, after tag this page, this page is, is in the wrong bucket. So on the eviction path, then we sort this page. We say, okay, this, uh, the bucket number is, let's say, one. But this page 
the generation number, uh, generation number counter of this page shows this page actually is two. So we move this page to the uh, bucket number two. So that's when we sort this page. And then after we sort all uh, pages that have been accessed, then the pages left are code pages. Then we're gonna evict those pages, code pages. That's generally how it works. Questions? Okay, so here's a question, why we want to uh, go, uh, we use, why we want to walk page tables instead of just using our map? Because when we walk our map, so we, uh, walk, we um, walk each page on the uh, IRIO list, and the, uh, those pages are physical pages, right? They're, they're, they're not necessarily mapped in, uh, by the same process. Usually they're not mapped in the uh, same VMA. So let's say we have two pages from two different processes. Okay, so on our, our list. So to walk the first, uh, to walk the R map of the first page, we have to um, go into the page tables of process A. Then for the next page, it is mapped in different process. So we have to switch to another uh, set of page tables. That costs a lot of uh, cache misses, right? Because, you know, these pages are not mapped um, consecutively within the single virtual uh, address space. So that's why we want to uh, walk page tables. But when we walk page tables, we could uh, uh, see a lot of uh, empty page tables, right? Page tables basically there are not freed and nothing in there. So how do we solve this problem? So we use, um, that's the next slide. So we use balloon filters to store dense hard page tables. If we have hard page table, okay, and uh, uh, okay, if we have page table, okay, if there's only a few pages mapped in this page table, we definitely don't want to walk this page table, right? We're not gonna store this in the um, volume filter. If we have another page table, and this page table maps a few pages from node A, maps another, uh, numa node A, maps another few pages from uh, uh, node, uh, numa node B, and then so on and so forth. So we also don't want to add this, pa this page table page into Bloom filter, why? Because reclaim is, the reclaim domain is per node per memory C group, right? So when we talk about reclaim, we only um, concern, we're only concerned with a single node at, 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 at any given time. So if a page table contains a lot of misplaced pages, we definitely don't want to add it to uh, a balloon filter because uh, that would mean we have to scan a lot of pages that, uh, not, uh, that are not eligible for reclaim. So, and why is this balloon filter, uh, why, uh, why, why, why we have two, uh, why, uh, these are balloon filters, so I'm gonna explain this later, okay. Why is this is a feedback loop? So, let's say first time we scan this page table, we don't see, uh, we, we see, okay, this page table is not that interesting, so we, we're not gonna insert it into the balloon filter. And then, how do we make sure next time, how do we make sure when uh, after the, this, uh, the process that owns this page table has mapped many pages into this page table, has uh, um, updated PTEs uh, in this page table, we're not gonna miss this page table. So we have to find a way to notify the page table worker that, okay, this tab this, uh, this pro the process owns this page table has updated it. And now uh, previously it was sparse and uh, uninteresting, but now it becomes dense and hot, so you, be, you better you know, uh, walk it. So we discover this, uh, this, we make this discovery when we walk our map, right? Because eventually we have to walk our map because we need to unmap this page. This, this is something that we, we can't uh, um, escape. So when we walk our map, we say, okay, so this page table seems very interesting has a lot of uh, relevant pages, and uh, um, probably you know next time when you uh, walk page table, you should just cover it. So then the this our uh, map walk as this page table, which is pointer pointer to this page table, the balloon filter. So then 
uh, when we walk pay table again, so we test whether this pointer to this bloom feeder is in this bloom feeder. Okay, yes, it, now it's in this bloom feeder, so the pay table will gonna cover this, um, uh, gonna cover this page table. So that's basically, uh, that's why it's the uh, feedback loop. So the second one is PID controller. So uh, in addition to uh, this, uh, you know, aging process, we also have eviction, right? So after we, after we evict a page, we want to know whether a page uh, gonna refault. If, if it refaults, so what information does this uh, tell us? Does this even tell us? So it means like, okay, probably we have made the wrong decision. So we need to uh, self-correct. How do you self-correct? Right, that's uh, where the uh, PID controller fits in. So there are some details I'm gonna uh, skip because I think uh, we might not have enough time. Um, but if you have uh, questions, please feel free to stop me at any time. So now I'm gonna move on to uh, the next step. So uh, one of our goals is uh, simplicity, okay. Well, apparently I misspelled simplicity, I, just, I put a simplify here. And uh, so um, I think, uh, you know, for, for some of you who have, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had a question. If you can go back uh, one more slide, I think. Um, so in the, uh, in the bottom left, the, um, the promotion. So it's, it's just a question of understanding. Um, if you have, say, five generations, right, mm -hmm. and you're, you're aging a page that's in the oldest generation, mm -hmm. um, and you see it's referenced, do you promote it one generation up, or do you put it all the way into the youngest? So that depends on the type of this page. If, it's, uh, if it was accessed through page tables, then uh, it will be promoted to the youngest generation. So we got skip everything you know, between the, this current generation and the youngest generation and go to youngest generation directly. If it's accessed uh, through uh, a uh, file descriptor, then it will be only moved to the next generation. Because this is based on the uh, cost of uh, uh, evicting this page. Because uh, if, if page fault is, is, uh, has a higher cost, right? Uh, mapped to, evicting a mapped page has a higher cost because we have to unmap this page, flush TLB, and do those stuff, right? And if it's not mapped and it's clean, then we could just simply drop it. So also, the access bit itself is not that accurate. So when we see the uh, access bit uh, set, right, this page could be accessed like a thousand times, even a million times. Right, but for a uh, page accessed through a file descriptor, so one access is one access. So because uh, we have uh, a, a hook function called a mark page access, so every time when we uh, go through, when we uh, f open, f read, then f read gonna uh, goes into mark page access. That's, that's definitely one access, right? Not 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 more than not more than one, definitely, right? So. Uh, yes. Yes, right. So uh, I think um, probably yesterday we talked about the uh, XFS uh, red page part, right? Because uh, file system people, they don't like uh, memory management or page recurrence goes into a uh, red page. Basically, we, we okay. So when the memory pressure kicks in, right, we see a dirty page first time, we mark it as page reclaim. So we say, okay, this, at this time, probably there are other clean pages we could drop. So we, let's not worry about it. So next time when we see a dirty page marked with page reclaim, we'll, we'll try to, okay, kiss up D, we'll try to write it. So, and then it will cause uh, a um, callback function from file system called a red page. I think it's not red pages, I think it's red page. And this write is uh, um, out of line uh, writing, right. right. That means, uh, okay, probably, you know, file system would think, okay, why, why do you want me to write a single page? And there's, there's a lot of work to do, right? It's a lot faster to write a bunch of pages. So with the MGRU, actually we don't really write any pages. So if we see this page is dirty, we just simply move to the next generation, 
we mark the dirty, and then move to the next generation. So then when, 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 when the red back is triggered, so that's when uh, the dirty resource hit. So we have dirty ratio to control uh, how many pages are dirty and how many pages must be clean, right? So, and managing NARIU helps to maintain a healthy dirty ratio by um, setting page dirty, by, set, call, by calling set page dirty. So when it walks page table, it says the dirty bit is set, right? It just called start set page dirty. So this way, the red back, if the red back doesn't happen, um, in time, then we still can uh, maintain a healthy um, dirty ratio. So basically, right back uh, works our map and to, to, to clear the access bit. Right? But uh, instead of clearing the access bit, we don't, uh, sorry, to clear the dirty bit. Instead of clearing the dirty bit, we don't really clear it. When we see it, we just set the page, we just call, call set page dirty. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, where I'm coming from is like when you look at how garbage collection uses generation, right? Generational garbage collection algorithms. What they do is they usually, um, it's based on the idea that the longer something has been in use, the more likely it's gonna be continued to be used. So everything starts with those things. Everything starts in the oldest generation. And when we find it referenced, we promote it up by one generation. Mm -hmm. And then if, if, it's, if it's referenced again, we promote it another way. And so the longer it's been around, the less likely it becomes to be reclaimed, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if the map pages start out at the youngest, mm -hmm. and if they get referenced anywhere on the lower generations, and you didn't promote them all the way back to the youngest, mm -hmm. what do the generations buy you? Like, say you have a difference between one configuration uses four generations, the other one uses five. Mm -hmm. If everything's promoted to always the youngest, what does that end going up buy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good question. I answered uh, just uh, after I clarify one more thing. So, uh, in terms of you know garbage collection, so here is also uh, actually you reuse a similar idea, which is um, when we run aging, run the aging, so everything actually slows down because we have to walk page tables, a lot of work to do, but comparing with you know suffering a little for a long time. We only suffered, you know, okay, we suffer a lot more, but for a very short period of time. So that, that's, that's basically we uh, batch a lot of things and then solve it uh, in a very uh, short period of time and then, okay, everything is good to go and you can uh, reclaim everything. So back to your question, this is really, very good. And this is something I'm gonna actually explain why um, we want generations. So the first goal here Unfortunately, I'm, uh, again, I missed it about uh, simplicity. So it's, simpl it's simplicity. So why we want to promote a uh, page, a mapped access page, page access through page table directly to the youngest generation, then what, what's the meaning of have uh, multiple generations? So I'm not sure uh, if you have noticed. So uh, when I post, posted the patch set, I, I called it uh, the uh, managing RIU framework. Why, why did it call it framework? Actually, is that allow, the, the ultimate goal is to allow everybody to extend it. This is based on the uh, belief, my personal belief, that one size fits all does not work anymore and that does not work anymore. So we have uh, different, uh, uh, we have uh, server, uh, data centers, uh, VMs, uh, laptop, desktop computers, and smartphones, right? Even uh, for a single platform, let's say a smartphone, we have uh, uh, this memory configurations uh, range from uh, 16 gig to uh, probably two gig, right? So I, I personally, I don't think one, one size fits all uh, work, gonna work. So. So how about I finish uh, answering, uh, answering uh, Johanna's question? So, and uh, we have generations. And with BPF, user it can customize which generation a page goes, right? So what do you suggest? It definitely makes a lot of sense for a lot of workloads. 
and uh, I, we, I, I do intend to make it work. But also, if we put this, this heuristic in kernel, then that means we're going to have uh, additional work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a uh, BPF interface, right? It contains a PID process ID, uh, what, was, uh, what address. If you know the uh, VMA layout, you know which uh, VMA this page is, uh, is from. And uh, so whether uh, the, the type of this page, whether it's uh, a, uh, a non page or file page, and the fault of this type, whether it's a refault or also a fresh fault, and then uh, some additional information, probably not that trivial. And uh, so based on this information, you can choose which generation to go. So with this, actually, we can emulate all the uh, different I, uh, IRU algorithms I, I know of. That's, that's the ultimate goal. So this idea actually is, is, uh, is not my, uh, uh, my uh, it's, I, I didn't come up with this idea. So I learned this from uh, networking congestion control. So they added something, uh, you know, for TCP, for TCP link, now when this um, when it gets congested, so it decides uh, the uh, what it call uh, retry the uh, back off back off time when to retry. So that's contrast control. So they they have like seven or eight different contrast control algorithms, heuristics in kernel space implement uh, written in C. So now they are moving those heuristics into user space into BPF. Sorry. So. We can do this in two ways. First one is struct, uh, BPF struct ops, which is like more complex. The easiest way actually is just a, a key prop. So I have this function, you can implement uh, a BPF program to override this, and uh, whatever you know, RIU algorithm you uh, come up with, that's your private, uh, that's your, um, you know, private uh, you know, uh, IP, and you don't have to share with me, right? <laughs> and you can maintain your, uh, Competitive edge, so that's that's the ultimate goal. Okay, so okay, just if I understand right, so the the patches as they are now, they're introducing the generations. The unmapped file pages are using fine grained generation control. Right. The default policy for map pages is to not use them as fine grained, right. but there are BPF hooks for future extension. Mm. Okay, I, I think I, I might have missed that when I was reading the patches. That would no, no, I, I, I actually I didn't mention it on the mailing list because I think a lot of other things I didn't mention on the mailing list. <laughs> Cause that uh, this, I, that this, would be really useful say. to have because I mean, like, okay, if it's promoting right away to mm. the youngest, what mm. are all the generations for? Mm. That, I, that would be really useful to have in the change logs okay. or like documents. Okay, because uh, uh, I, I were trying to, you know, uh, Limit our discussion uh, within a uh, you know manageable scope. That's why I didn't talk about this. But now you know I I, I, I probably I think there was uh, a mistake on my part. I should have uh, explained this uh, better. More questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, next step. So I think I, I did touch on this a little bit uh, during our last meeting, and. Uh, this is about the THP internal fragmentation detection. So uh, also, I think yesterday, uh, Yang asked another question, or probably suggested something, um, pre-table scanning to detect uh, hardware uh, filter poison pages. Sorry, I don't remember the, your exact question. This is a similar idea. So uh, how much time do I have? OK. I have uh, exact half an hour. So uh, when we use huge pages, right, and uh, we have two uh, problems. Usually we have two problems. One is the external fragmentation um, preventing us from allocating huge pages. The second one is internal fragmentation. Basically, we have uh, TGP never, TGP amortized, TGP always, right? Let's say if your user space doesn't really uh, support TGP uh, doesn't use uh, amortized, then the only uh, options left are uh, never or always. So a lot of user space applications, a lot of uh, workloads, for example, uh, Memcached, Redis, they suggest we turn out, uh, users turn off THP. Why? This is because A, THP are not easy to, THPs are not that easy to allocate because of external fragmentation. The second problem, the second problem which actually is like 
worse is the uh, internal fragmentation. After we allocate this huge page, right, this workload could only use 4K, uh, 2 meg uh, huge page. This workload probably going to only use 4K of this within this 2 meg region. So we basically waste 511 4K pages. And that's not the, uh, the worst part. The worst part is if this 4K page is hot, right, so the access bit, we only have one access bit, which is in the PMD entry and put into this huge page. So the access bit in this PMD entry will always be set. So we'll consider this entire huge page hot. And it will be always on, uh, um, at the head of the uh, RIU list. So we're never going to reclaim it. And basically, we wasted uh, 511 uh, 4K pages. So this extension is going to solve this problem. Basically, when we start off, we don't map a compound page by PMDs. We, instead, we map this compound page by PTEs. That means we're going to have 5, 12 consecutive PTEs pointing to this compound page. This is still a compound page, OK? So this is not uh, 5, the, uh, this is not 5, 12, 4K pages. Then um, let's see if this workload uses most of uh, the uh, uh, space within this compound page, then good. We just remove this PTE table and then swap it with the PMD entry. So this becomes a true huge page. If not, let's see, they only use one 4K page, but this 4K page is hot, OK? So when the system is under memory pressure, MGRU is going to look at this PTE page table, the 512 PTE, PTEs, then say, OK, actually, there's only one page is hot, and the rest, they're not only code. They, they, they have never been touched. Because by looking at that, that dirty bit, we see the dirty bit is uh, uh, zero. So then we can just split this page, right? And then free the uh, 512 unused 4K pages, uh, only keep the 4K page uh, 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 as the in memory. Does it make any sense? Yeah, just want to ask just for clarification. Is this something that you envision to happen, or this is something that we are talking about code that already exists, and you would like to get it merged with the rest of the thing? So it won't happen within two years. So that's for sure. OK, and, so that's uh, it's a future very, plan. Yes, it will like, very likely to happen within four years. So basically between two and four years. Okay, I, I think that it makes uh, some sense to discuss those things, uh, but uh, I, I guess one of the things that uh, we should definitely spend some time on is uh, uh, what you've got currently and uh, you aim to get merged. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure whether there is general consensus within the group uh, how we should proceed on that. So mm -hmm. it would be really great if, if you have some more extensions so that we can see how much that can, or how much potential there is uh, in there that's definitely valuable. But mm -hmm. if you can spend or reserve something like 15 minutes uh, sure. to discuss those, uh, um, what we've got right now, mm -hmm. things as well. So, so okay, so let, let, let me go back uh, one page before. So this, this extension gonna happen, if let's say I'm Jerry lands in 519, so this is gonna happen within three months, the first one. So the second one, it's going to happen sometime next year, early next year. But as, when I said two years, that means uh, everything you know, must, you know, will be done in two years. It's uh, very unlikely. Right? But uh, you know, we, we're going to start uh, posting uh, more patches. So that, that's, but that, that's going to happen uh, really soon. So, but uh, whether the patch is going to uh, be merged, though that, that's, that's you know, within you know, two to four uh, year's uh, time frame. So uh, this is the last extension we have here. Yes, this is the last extension. So the last one is uh, uh, about VM ballooning. I think uh, uh, David might be uh, interested in this part. 
So basically, uh, for our multi VM workload, so if we have multiple VMs and we want to overcommit the host, and we want to know uh, which uh, VM we want to take memory from, and which uh, VM we want to uh, give memory to. So, so this multi generation are you uh, gives a uh, histogram. Basically, is what I showed here before. So the one on the uh, right side, and based on this histogram. So we can decide, okay, so in this example, VM1 has more code memory. Again, uh, the uh, bluish colors uh, mean code, the, the, the reddish colors mean hot. So, and VM2, it has uh, more hot memory, so we, we don't want to take memory uh, from, uh, away from VM2. So that's, that's another uh, extension. Basically, uh, this is similar to uh, free page reporting and free page hinting. And instead of uh, uh, re reporting free pages, we're going to report a working set. So this is working set reporting. And uh, with this information, um, when we have multiple VMs, we can decide uh, you know, how to balance uh, memory, how to uh, share memory uh, between them or among them. So yeah, uh, I mean in general, like whenever we talk about working set size estimation, we are making guesstimates. And the real issue is if, if you take a look at the VM at a certain point in time or just at any process, you might think you have an idea what's happening, but like that could change any point in time. So it could be that that VM is idling for like 500 days and then you decide, oh yeah, like I'm gonna shrink that VM and just at that point in time, somebody starts up a huge application and essentially you trigger out of memory conditions. So that is actually like why I, I wouldn't say detest, but detest is the right word. I detest auto ballooning. Because like you, you think you know what you're doing in a hypervisor, but you actually have no clue what your guest is doing. And the nice thing, for example, about free page hinting is that that your your virtual machine still has all of the memory available. And like if you run into that like scenario where some like the VM suddenly goes crazy on memory or the OS, it can still make use of that memory. Whereby if you like inflate the balloon, it takes usually some time for you to detect that you can deflate the balloon or if you want to do that out of random context, you're usually in trouble. So uh, it, it's a nice idea for working set size estimation and it might, for example, help maybe to, to set like C groups in a certain way with swappiness or something like that. But like shrinking the ends in that way, I'm usually a little bit more pessimistic that it, it works reliably. But I think it will be a good tool. So I get what you're saying. For working set size estimation, it will be a very good tool, I think. OK, thanks. So uh, this is uh, agnostic to whatever technique you're going to use to shrink VMs. So I just use uh, you know, ballooning as an example. So it could be a word PMM or word, word MAM, anything you know, that works for you. So the working set reporting are from guest. So like the guest has to communicate this information uh, through a uh, through the word balloon device. So that that's that it needs a channel to communicate this information back to the host. That's the only requirement. Of course, it doesn't have to be uh, word word blown. So it's, wouldn't it also work somehow that you would do it in a hypervisor and take a look at the physical pages and how how they age? That that also works, but. In the uh, hypervisor, right, we don't really know the page types, right? We, we don't know, okay, because uh, I'm Jerry going to tell you the code's pages actually are uh, from page cache. So this information is lost if we uh, try to guess the work is, uh, working set outside VM. Yeah, right. You're right. My question would be if, like, the guest operating system, for example, when you shrink the VM, is able to rebalance them. Like, like although like you don't have all the information at hand, it might be good enough for like certain working set size estimations, where you simply care about like what's the maximum size of my VM. It all gets more 
problematic with memory tiering. That, that's what I learned. <laughs> Today, I learned everything gets more complicated with memory mm -hmm. tiering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's just an option, right? Uh, and uh, if, if well, now we, we, uh, to be honest with you, right now, I, I don't know how well or how bad it's going to work. So, but that, that's the direction uh, we want to uh, investigate. So that's why this right now this, uh, this uh, is like extension three. It has uh, the uh, lowest priority, and the first one, of course, has the uh, highest priority. More questions? Yeah, so I do not have questions regarding the, um, those extensions or the, or the implementation because uh, I'm not sure there is much to discuss there. Um, there has been discussion on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we as a group have uh, shown some, uh, let's say, concerns. So uh, I would like to focus on the, where we go from here. So y you've got your code that uh, it seems that long term there is uh, quite some nice potential for um, uh, for extending that uh, uh, that let's say implementation that is currently not really possible with our existing LRU uh, implementation, or at least that's my my perception. On the other hand, uh, our LRU implementation has been tweaked and proven by many years, so. Uh, uh, I do not think it's possible to simply replace one by another. So, right, uh, totally agree. Yeah, so so right now you, you've got that opt-in uh, kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm really wondering what also other people in the room feels. Uh, so if we go and, and get that merged, because uh, there is, that's the only way how to find out how that uh, implementation really mm -hmm. works on the large scale deployments, right? So how should we go about that? Because um, one approach might be uh, to simply uh, merge it and uh, uh, have it opt in for uh, people just to enable it and try to play with that. Mm -hmm. Another option might be to simply merge it and enable it by default and let it go through fire and I mean, expose that to users and mm -hmm. tell them that, okay, if, if that doesn't really work well, then uh, that should be really looked into and, mm -hmm. and debugged and fixed probably, or mm -hmm. maybe just concluded that this kind of algorithm simply doesn't work well with that uh, uh, workload. And you are back to our original implementation. And I can see that both approaches have some advantages and disadvantages. Right and also maintaining two Im different implementations of LRU will be definitely a maintenance cost. So uh, those are all things that we should really con um, um, take or keep in mind. And uh, Totally agree, yes. So is, is there something that we can agree on here? Yeah, uh, I can see Mel has a hand raised, so um, do you want to say something before we Oh, God. <laughs> we can hear you. Oh, OK. Thanks for that. <laughs> Mel? Mel, you have disappeared. Yes. Uh, You're back. Hello. Hey. Um, I think I. Uh, uh, that if this was merged, it should be enabled by default in as much places as possible. And um, and uh, a major limitation on that at the moment is Max SMP. It requires Max SMP to be disabled. Now, that's enabled on at least OpenSUSE, uh, SLE, according to Git kernel source, it's enabled on Fedora and RHEL. And maybe somebody in the room can confirm uh, Debian. I think later Debian set at max SMP. So even if it was a merge, and even if it was default, yes, most major distribution, or at least some major distributions, will not be able to even run it. 
and it would be important that limitation be moved. Um, I'm guessing the masks SMP limitation is based on the number of bits consumed for nodes shift. Right, and uh, somehow uh, I think I, I add that uh, uh, depending not on max SMP um, a long time ago, and after I got a report uh, of build error, and somehow I couldn't reproduce it anymore. So I'm gonna remove it uh, probably, uh, I, I have already removed it in my repo. So I'm gonna post the next version, so uh, that part will be gone. So uh, I think, I hopefully, you know, not gonna cause any build errors, and then, uh, if not, then I guess problem solved. If uh, there's still a problem, then I do have a plan to uh, address this issue. Basically, we have uh, additional space. Uh, okay, basically, basically, we can remove some page flags uh, by... Uh, for <laughs> oh, who's, who's talking? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think I shared that plan with you. And I think we can remove page swap back. Right, basically a non-page, uh, page announce is always swap back. And, uh, oh, they're not, because you can M advise free them and right, then we right. clear swap back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. Then they go on the file, so, LRU. Basically, uh, SHMAM is always swap back. A noun can be, uh, the swap back can be removed, can be uh, cleared if we uh, want to, something called lazy free, or, or M advise free, yes, right. So that part, but we still can. Uh, let's, let's let me think. I think I, I I have a solution for that part, but I I just uh, couldn't remember it. Uh, a, a, another possibility would be simply to okay, drop the oh, maximum okay. nodes shift if um, if MGLRU is enabled, because the current uh, value for max S P allows for a thousand and twenty four human nodes. And maybe the room can answer, does anyone know realistically of a machine that has 1,024 human nodes? <laughs> there was the no microphone at all. It says a pumpkin, that. and I don't know what a pumpkin computer is. <laughs> You, you could you could design it. I mean, the problem is like now now every single performance class gets a proximity domain or gets a, gets a NUMA ID, but yeah, but 1,024 sounds degenerate. Okay, now remember how to uh, remove page swap back. Basically, for uh, a non page is marked uh, as lazy free, we can use an additional bit in page mapping. Right, this is a noun, and it's marketed pay, uh, lazy free. We use another bit, because we have a, a spare bits in page mapping. So we can move there, so we can uh, remove page swap back. And uh, I think- we don't have, because it's 32 bits. You have to respect 32 bits and align it around, you know, for two bits, and they're using- Maybe they use micro- We only use three right now. A noun, KSM. Wait, 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 we're using two bits, because for 32 bits, you can only use like the last two bits. And to get another bit only works on 64 bits. As, as far as I know, due to the alignments of them, the map. Oh, no, are we talking about a page no, mapping? I, 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 I don't think that's true, David, because we k malloc all the things that we point to with page mapping, right? And the minimum k, map, k malloc alignment is eight bytes, even on 32 bit, right? I think a better bet is just going to be to wait for separately allocated folios. <laughs> I mean, page bits are... We, we've seen this. I, I, I love your optimism. Um, the, 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 there are some page flags we can get rid of. I, I've, I've been looking and, and thinking hard. Uh, one is page private. Um, the file systems can simply say, is the private field null? I need a bit of cooperation from some, from some file system maintainers, but I think you know people can understand this is for the good of all of us. If we had one more bit in page flags, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I, I think we're getting a little off into the weeds here. Um, the, 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 the context of the discussion is MGLRU rather than saving page bits in general as a problem, and we could get stuck okay. into that for the next like hour. 
Um, I just think that the max SMP limitation right now is a strong limiter because if major distributions cannot enable this, um, and I know there's other big distributions out there, but uh, anyone who has max SMP set at the moment can't use MGLRU, and that's going to be a bit of a maintenance headache. And if that means that no, that the nodes shift needs to drop to make space, then so be it. But it should be at least a prerequisite because at least my own preliminary evaluation of this shows the performance of it is not bad, but it is better on U on UMA machines than it is on UMA machines. So there's likely to be some fallout from this. And if we go through like a couple of years of development and no one's actually running the thing, significant effort will be put into maintaining two separate implementations, only to find out that when someone tries to actually use it, it has to be torn out again. Um, I agree with all that, Mel, and that, that's, that's a large part of my thinking. I mean, if we can look forward in the future, if, if this thing is going to be a success, it's going to follow a well-known path. We'll put it in, we can enable it at config time or at run time, and nobody will use it. Mm -hmm. And then various engineers and various organisations will turn it on, let's give right. this a whiz with our usual workloads, hey, this shows promise, and they'll start allocating resources to it. It'll get better and better and better, and eventually people will start switching to it. Mm -hmm. And let, I'll come back to that later. But what makes that process so much harder as a combination is to get those people up to speed. What makes it so much harder is the combination of the code itself and its development history. Mm. I don't know who wrote it. I don't know who to contact. We don't have access to all that institutional knowledge if it's been years of development. It, it's, you're sure you're a fine chap, but it's, it's only you. Mm. Combine that with the fact the code base itself is, is inscrutable. I tried to read it, and all I saw was a whole bunch of C statements. <laughs> <laughs> that does not tell the whole story. So I implore you to put at least two person weeks into making. And when you document this code, don't look at it from your point of view. Look at it from the point of view of Mel or Hannah's or even somebody old and stupid like me. Try and tell me a story to help get me up to speed over this two year transitional period. Now I share this concern with Mel that we'll reach the point where it's wonderful for most workloads, but for some things the legacy LAE is still better. We've still got slab and slub. The, the, you know, we were supposed to delete one of those 10 years ago, but still one has advantages over the other, so we've never been able to hit the kill, kill switch. So I think we should have an objective, deleting the old one, which means making MGLE a superior in all respects. Uh, I understand it hasn't seen a lot of use on Big Iron. I don't think the prod kernel people are really using it in, in any anger yet, so if, if Google could do that, that would make things more confident. But also, I'm being a bit hypocritical here. We don't have this problem with file systems. We encourage people to choose whatever file system chooses, uh, serves their purposes the best, and we're proud of it. But for some pre problem, we have, for some reason, we have the opposite problem in Core MM. Why don't we have 15 LAUs? Choose which other ones are best for you. And Linus has declared that we're never going to have a pluggable CPU scheduler. That wasn't Linus. That was Peter. Oh, okay. And you could say the same thing of file systems, but we don't. But um, I, I, you know, I think unless people set fire to me, I could see us merging this in the next RC cycle with the big warning button on it to give people the time to play with it. But it's the it's that issue of how we help engineers ramp up. You know, I'm taking a, we're taking a group of people who have been working on existing stuff for decades, essentially turning them into new hires and throwing them a new code base, which doesn't have code comments, without the benefit of the guy in the next cubicle who's been working on it for a long time. This is a problem. Right. Uh, I agree with uh, most of your points. So, uh, OK, let, let, let me, let me uh, start uh, from my point of view. So my first problem, which is a uh, chicken egg problem, so uh, this is regarding how uh, we, I, 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 I do want to find more people to use it. Uh, at least I, I, start, I started internally at Google. So I went to, okay, you're not running through it. I'm gonna talk to you. So I went to the, uh, I went to the Android team. Okay, I went to the Android team. I asked the Android team, could you try this? Okay, and uh, collect some data and then we can show the app dream that this is something promising. 
and uh, we can, uh, you know, keep the ball rolling, and uh, you know, uh, right? And uh, I'll let Suran answer how many times he asked me when will this be in the afternoon. So they won't try it until it's in the afternoon. And <laughs> from the algorithm point of view, right? How, why would I merge something you know that nobody actually has used? If it's not proven, not should be in the uh, you know in, my, in, in the afternoon, right? This is one thing. So I also talked to the product kernel team. I think uh, Michelle was there. So she, uh, he also could uh, you know tell you how I asked product, how many times I asked product, uh, uh, Google data center team to take this and try this and then give me some feedback. So I think their initial response was, okay, this is never going to be in the afternoon. So we're not going to try it. <laughs> they just wrote it off. So that's, 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 that's a problem, you know, so, I have to. No, it's, it's the upstream first. Like they, everything wants to be like, if it's upstream, then we'll take it. Right, I got I, I, yeah, right. You, you have very good point. I got to answer, answer that. So then, so I, then I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? Yeah. So I can't, I can't just let it die, right? So what I did is, I talked to my management. I said, okay, let's uh, allocate some fund to hire a third-party company, third-party independent lab, to verify this. So and they can post data to show, uh, you know, its benefits. Right, so that's where the data performance numbers actually came from. So they're not from Google, unfortunately, right? But they are independent. So that, that that's that's uh, the okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I think that while I do agree that uh, hearing about the history uh, behind that is really an important part, but uh, I guess we will not get that full story, and I can live with that. So uh, I guess the, the primary question is that uh, if we get that merged, and it seems that nobody is objecting to having that uh, this, uh, enabled by default, so essentially declare the next release as a reclaim fire, and uh, you might see quite a lot of bug reports, <laughs> and you can not really expect that the existing uh, reclaim community uh, called the, all both of them <laughs> as a community um, so there will that would be a lot of uh, potentially a lot of work on your end and are you prepared for that are you prepared that if we see a lot of bug reports and they are not getting addressed because you are overloaded or there is not mm -hmm. enough manpower to mm -hmm. handle that mm -hmm. so that the whole thing gets reverted and you get another chance probably. So mm -hmm. that's probably a very important question f from me. So no, I'm not prepared for that. that that's definitely a no. Well, so that's why I added a kill switch. That's why there's one time switch to turn on and off. Okay. There's a, no, of course, I'm, I'm, uh, okay. no, I'm not saying that you really have to fix all of them in mm -hmm. a week time. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying that uh, if there are bug reports, they really, they will make you busy for a long time. And mm -hmm. uh, are you able to, or are you willing, or uh, do you have capacity to devote that time on that, because if the answer is no, then no. I do not see how we can get that merge. So well, there, okay. there are tricks we can play, you know. Okay, I, let, I can let. enable it by default in Linux next for one day, and then disable it the <laughs> next day, and then not read my email for three days. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think you're going so, to get some reasonable metrics on well, LRU think, um, problems in one day. Yeah. So Malk, could you repeat that? Because you were probably lost in the noise. Uh, you're not going to get reasonable metrics on um, LRU efficiency in like one day of enabling, unless it's like an absolute abject failure. But I ran us through uh, five separate machines with a variety of workloads and it didn't crash. So I don't think it's going to be an outright functional failure. The key for an, any LRU is can it preserve hot data or not, which is much more subtle and takes a longer amount of time to detect if it is an issue. <clears throat> but for me, any merging of this that is not enabled by default by most major distributions 
due to Max Lucy is a hard stop because it's going to take years to rattle out. And if the primary author is not available to deal with any issues to come up, that's a bit of an issue. So I think the question uh, all comes down to whether uh, Google is going to uh, continue the uh, investment in this area. So the answer definitely yes, because I haven't finished my story. And now, after you know Andrew has taken uh, the uh, patch set, then the Android team said, yes, we're going to use it. And uh, the product current team, the data center team at Google said, yes, right, we are all in. So we have uh, that, uh, you know, the headcount the budget you know, plan for the next many years. So back to your question. Uh, one, one second, let me finish this. Uh, so back to uh, Michael's question. Uh, would somebody at Google be prepared to maintain this for long term? Yes. But that, would that be the model that I'm, uh, I, I have for envisioned? No. Because I think eventually, this is going to go to the uh, you know, community mode. So my, my, my role is to start it and then show the benefits to everybody. And uh, I try, if you, you are not convinced, I can try again, try again, try again, until you are convinced. OK, so you think, OK, this, this is something worth trying. So you're going to try it, right? And then going to move to the next company or next person to do this. So my next step actually is to work with uh, user space. The Redis, um, Memocache D doesn't have a backing company. So uh, then the next company, uh, Postgres, which is backed by EDB, uh, MariaDB, and MySQL, uh, MySQL, there are two uh, different co companies. And those companies, and also uh, Databrick, they are the, uh, the owns uh, Apache Spark. To work with them, so in their menus, I'm going to ask them to add something like, OK, MJRU has uh, shown pr uh, promising results when running uh, you know, this, their applications. I just suggest you know, if uh, you have newer kernels, you should turn this on. So that's my next step. All right. So also, I have been working with many companies in private. So actually, I have reached almost of all of you guys. I think I, uh, David Rentis has sent you guys emails like a couple of years ago to invite you guys to join uh, some meetings, conferences with us. So I'm going to continue to push um, on that front. So after, now, um, in, after we have built enough momentum, so then probably I could just sit back and uh, you know, take a break. The rest of you guys could say, because I think Andrew mentioned, oh, OK, you, you, you just put all of us out of job. No. So I know you have been here no. for a long time, right? No, you, I, I, I've been working on this. In, you know, Generally, I have been working in this industry for a long time as well. So I'm not thinking like next three months, next three years. No, right. I'm thinking about the next five years or yeah. next decade. You didn't put it out of a job. You, you, gave, <laughs> them, you, you gave them. <laughs> of course, I'm still. Yeah. You I, gave them all new jobs. Thank you very much. I want to disagree with you, Mel. I think putting it in default off that has considerable value. It certainly sounds like it's going to make it much easier for Google to put resources behind it. And it makes it much easier for other organizations to play with it and decide if they, if they wish to ramp additional resources into it, if they see promise. There's basically no good choices there. Um, if, if it's not enabled by default, uh, particularly early in its uh, lifetime when it has been merged, um, the vast majority of people are not going to uh, end up running it. Because sure, at the end of the day, evaluating LRU is difficult because its primary job is to identify the hot working set. Yeah, but I and think a, a, th a three-year cutover would be a success. I mean, better uh, FS. Still, better FS. The, the people, when that went in, it was a joke. Six months after better FS went in, it'd get an Eno mem corner and collapse in the heap. But people worked on it. It got better and better. Engineers ramped up with it, and now now it's big time. People would notice data integrity issues far faster than they would notice um, page and version, page age and version issues, or something similar, sure. or like identifying changes in phase behavior. Like typically, for any of the um, LRU type bugs that we have dealt with in the past, the vast majority of them have been desktop and interactivity related, where the when the system is. Uh, getting into a swap storm, like 
KSwap D being pegged as 100% CPU, or the desktop is jittering, or video playback stops working when I am doing a kernel compile in the background, or something similar to this. And for that, it would have to be enabled for interactive users early on. Um, they, Pedro Glaim on the enterprise side, it's not that big of an issue, but uh, 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 until it is absolutely is an issue with the runtime that you get a corner case. But for uh, normal desktop users, major problems with LRUs tend to, or LRU bugs tends to show up very quickly. So I would push heavily on the enable by default and particularly removing the max SMP um, limitation so that SLE, OpenSUSE, Fedora, RHEL, and at least Debian enable it. Or at least play with it first, yeah. Or at least play with it in so far as to complain about it and they get overwhelmed by bugs and disable it by default, which is useful in itself. But like we, if we don't want to see a, a case where five years of development is put into MGLRU, um, and then it turns out no one's enabled it because, because they can't, because of uh, Max SMP or some weird corner case. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to this being merged. Um, I just think that it should be enabled by default as quickly as possible because THP was enabled by default at the very beginning and it set everything on fire. And it took about three years to actually sort it out. And if it wasn't enabled by default, I don't think it would ever have sorted it out. So uh, I, I I'm not sure if I understand correctly. So what's the uh, benefits of uh, enabling this by default as soon as possible instead of, uh, you know, working you know, in a uh, steady pace? Uh, because it becomes, a, it becomes a Heisenberg issue. You don't, observe a, you, you, you don't observe a problem until you measure it. If it's disabled by default, it's not measured. So... Uh, so he, okay, I, I'll give you an example. How, this is how I usually think. So uh, at Google, when we roll out a new feature, so what do we do is like we have a million of users uh, or, or even tens of million of users, right, uh, or servers. So what do we do is after we add something, we release a new binary, but this feature start uh, initially turn off. And then we turn down on 1% of the machines, and then 5%, then 10%. If everything goes well, after we're going to reach like 100% within a year or so. And if something goes wrong, then we just roll, roll back and back to the beginning and fix it, and then try this process again. So that's uh, the uh, way I, uh, I'm used to in terms of uh, you know, thinking pro think process. So uh, I think, uh, personally, I would prefer uh, MGRU follows this process. So uh, by working with uh, you know, those third-party companies, user space um, application providers, you know, we, we just try this with uh, all major uh, workloads. Let's see, uh, we, we, we know them, uh, which workloads actually consume a high amount of memory. Then we start, one by, or we start uh, with the list one by one, and then we tackle the um, problem. That's, that's how I, uh, at least at the moment, uh, see the best way to uh, move forward. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, Matt has a question. I completely... Oh, go ahead. I completely agree this is the way to bring it up in a fleet. Uh, like when, you, when you're when uh, you a company that has uh, data centers and warehouses distributed across massive geographical locations, and it would apply for Google and it would apply for companies like Meta, but it doesn't help uh, any of the major distributions which are responsible for shipping a general OS for when and how do they do the switch over if there isn't a large amount of backing data. But just because it works for a fleet of machines and warehouses does not necessarily mean it works in a general case. If you reduce number of generations to two, how much is the difference between MGRU and the, the legacy or existing GRU? Uh, LRU, sorry. So by design, we, we, we can't just reduce the number of generations to two. It, ha it has to use four. 
because uh, it distributes pages in, uh, across all four generations. So we, we can extend it beyond four generations. So by the way, we can't reduce it anymore. So it's, right now it's hard coded at four. So uh, go ahead, Johannes. Oh, uh, just on the enablement, um, so what was interesting, I think, on the mailing list is that there were actually quite a few people who said, if this is going to be available in the kernel, I'm going to turn it on. I think mm -hmm. one of them was the Arch Linux main, uh, kernel maintainer. Right. So I think I disagree a little bit on the if we don't enable it right now, nobody will use it. I think there are different distributions. Some of them are not as eager to try new stuff than mm -hmm. others. I think there will be some. Like, I think if we merged it, default no, and we have it like this for two or three releases, I mm -hmm. think people will use it and will experiment with it. Um, and, you know, it's not a guarantee, but you might be able to space it out a little bit so you don't have flak day and then everything's on fire. Mm -hmm. You might get some early reports. I, I think, I, I don't think that's entirely unlikely. I, I, I just want to agree with Johannes uh, and to disagree with Mel about um, uh, THP being enabled by default being but the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> uh, documentation lives forever, it turns out, and you can still find docu documentation published by a prominent database vendor who I shall not name, but I've been fighting very hard internally to get them to stop doing that, that says you must turn off THP because it absolutely created database performance. Yes, it did 10 years ago. Now it doesn't. We fixed it. Delete this documentation. and finding the documentation owner and getting it changed is hard, it turns out. Um, yes, it doesn't die off the web. And it doesn't die off forums. And, and you find people, you know, sysadmins helping each other by telling them these things. And it's like, yeah, that was true when you learned it. Have you, have you benchmarked it recently? Do you have any idea it's true? It's not true. So yeah, in it, merge it by default, off by default, until we've got the bugs out of it, and then enable it. Even if it was the cave on that particular one, it would still have to be, would still remove the Mac SMP one. So even if it's disabled by default, but can be online, that should still be available. So I think this all comes down to uh, benefit risk you know, analysis or risk benefit analysis. So uh, personally, I don't really mind turning on by default. But then uh, it would become others' problem, because you know, if we turn around by default and uh, we break something, right? And uh, uh, okay, I break something, okay. So uh, you know, the other person you know, who uh, users they suffer. So personally, I don't want that uh, to happen. So. I, 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 do, I, I do hope one day we can switch to uh, MJRU by default, but I think uh, that might not, it, it could happen you know, probably sometime next year, but I, I, I think you know, we might not want to turn it on immediately for everybody. That sounds kind of uh, risky to me. Yeah. Yes, right. So I, I think if we merge a default, no, I think there should still be a, um, a very tangible time frame for enabling it. Mm -hmm. um, like I wouldn't say like in a couple years we'll switch it to default on. I I think it it should be a couple kernel versions at max because you'll get a lot of early adopters and you know those tend to be you ha you have your use cases that you care more about than others. Those will be people that run laptops and desktops at home, and they're, you're going to be inundated with bugs mm -hmm. that you might not necessarily be most excited about, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I turn swappiness to zero, why is it swapping? Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think you can take the heat off that a little bit and deal with those up front and space it out a little bit. But I, I, yeah, if, if there's not a concrete plan to enable it in a reasonable time frame, I think then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm calling time, guys, because we've got to wrap it up. All right. Thank you.